The Languedoc Roussillon region of France is one of the most evocative destinations in the world. And for me, it was love at first sight. I now call the beautiful medieval town of Uzes my home for many months of the year. What better way to share it than with a week-long movable feast? I call those who join me on my guided culinary adventures my gastronomers. And the south of France is a land of incredible flavours and atmosphere. So come with me. I'm Peter Mathias and this is my culinary adventure in the south of France. In this, the final episode of my southern French culinary adventure, I'm drawn back to the Camargue. It's an area of France unique and famous for its immense salt flats, 25,000 acres, stretching as far as the eye can see, the size of Paris. The walled medieval town of Aiguemont is perched on the edge of the salt flats, renowned for its impenetrable power its devotion to the area's culinary traditions and its spicy Spanish influence. Also in this episode, I plunge into an evening of festivities with some wild Edamont locals. I give the very best French olive oil the slurp test. And as for my gastro nomad, it's enduring classics and a grand finale with an unplugged French test. Egamalt in the Camargue. It is one of the most beautiful old walled towns in the whole of the south of France. And the people here are very, very proud of their town because it goes right back to medieval times. It was built by King Louis IX and it was just a swamp, but it was a very strategic swamp. In the 13th century, they decided to build walls all around it to protect it from those marauding Spanish and Provençals around the corner. What Aiguemort is famous for now is mostly tourism. It's a centre for the menards and the farms in the surrounding area, but most importantly, it's famous for that fabulous Camargue sea salt. 60 million litres of salt water per year is pumped into the salt-producing lakes, coloured pink by a type of algae. It takes a full year to evaporate before being harvested, starting in August. This is a salt lake that is almost ready to be recolted. There's hardly any water left, which will evaporate off in about a week, and then they can collect. It's very hard what I'm standing on, and when you look over it, it's beautifully sparkly, like my Italian shoes. Really beautiful. Back in the day, the salt was scraped from the evaporated surface by hand. Very labor-intensive work. These days, the process is abetted by heavy machinery and trucked to the great salt mountains along 500 kilometers of Salt Lake Road. It's the job of the Sunye to measure the salt's density in the lead up to the recolt. It's a role handed through generations and requires great attention because the best salt, a prized top layer called the fleur de sel, or the flower of salt, is still harvested by hand at precisely the right moment. See, he's just taking it off the top surface. It's just sitting there. And that's it. The most expensive salt in the world. I feel the little flakes. Et comme c'est pas lavé, on s'est ramassé tel quel, et particulièrement sur la table du client, du consommateur, on garde tous ces produits qui sont qui sont très intéressants. Yeah, and he says. What's sold to you in the little boxes is basically this. Almost exactly the same thing, uh. slightly dried out. Egamort's ancient streets are geared for the tourist trade. The town square occupied with garrisons of cafe tables. Once upon a medieval time, though, it was all about ascending France. And the Tour de Constance, with its two identical levels and five meter thick walls, was built to keep undesirables out and, as it happened, in. This is where King Louis slept in this room when he was in Egamont. And then subsequent to that, this building was used as a prison 
for people like the Knights Templar, for the Huguenots who were the Protestants, and there are inscriptions on the wall here from prisoners, uh, where, like this one, for example, says um, the person's name, and at the end it says, Issa Mekchis, which means, and his mistress, because the Catholics refused to allow the Protestants to marry, so they had to call their wives mistresses. There's also um, an inscription over here for one Huguenot woman who was imprisoned here for 38 years because she refused to change to Catholicism, and she wrote an inscription which is still here under this piece of glass, and it says, Resiste. I will always resist. The sleepy quaintness of Egermont today belies the town's historic importance. For centuries it was a major port for exporting cloth and wine and for importing spices and silk. Naturally, it attracted people from everywhere, in particular the saucy Spanish, who stayed to this day, presenting a fabulous opportunity for some flamenco dancing. Caroline and her partner Andre have agreed to perform for me. And where better than in the town square with an impromptu audience? I've always adored flamenco. The hand movements are so seductive. And petite, gorgeous Caroline is a virtuoso. Yes, she says that the movement is supposed to represent birds. Et, et la Seviana, expliquez-moi l'origine de ça. Alors, la Seviana, c'est le folklore de Séville. Donc ça se danse en quatre parties. Mm. La une, la deux, la trois et la quatre. La une, c'est la rencontre. Mm -hmm. On a fait toutes les deux. La... Ok, la Seviana se danse en quatre parties. La première partie est la meeting. Mm. La deux, c'est la séduction. La deuxième partie est la séduction. La trois, c'est la dispute. The third part is the dispute. Et la quatre, c'est la réconciliation. Oh, and the fourth part is the reconciliation. Well, I'm reconciled that this dance is best left to the experts with the blood of Spain. And in this case, southern France flowing in their veins. I swear my pulse is racing from the sidelines. culinary students are visiting the city of Nîmes, famous for the Arena de Nîmes, where Spanish-style bullfighting takes place. We, however, have food in mind. David and I have brought them to Les Halles, a huge undercover market with a mind-boggling array of fresh produce and specialty foods. The only restaurant here is run by a magnificent southern French woman, Arlette. A real discovery, a gem. The Arlette is really basically she's a food writer and she became a cook by necessity because when the old Arlette was pulled down, all the life and all the cafes and all the tiny little restaurants in the streets all around it disappeared and there was no more traditional mean food. And so she started up this restaurant so that people could have the traditional regional food of this area again. Our less version of bull meat stew, or agriad, a specialty of Nîmes and Camargue, towns like Egamoc, is to die for. And in the old days, because it was full of vinegar and acid, um, and they didn't have fridges, you could just leave it somewhere cool like the basement, and then you could just read it up, reheat it the next day and keep eating it. That's a wonderful expression in French. She's talking about it's very important what... Cocotte you use. Cocotte is a cooking dish. Les meilleurs sont faits dans des plus anciennes marmites, which oui. is a reverence to older women being the best lovers. Oui, mais nous, on ajoute que c'est avec des jeunes I know. <laughs> she says, but the important part is to add a young carrot. <laughs> and so, the layering of ingredients. Herbs, uh, bacon, lemon zest, and juice. And anchovies. This is her mix that she puts in, which has onion, capers, parsley, zestine, and jambon blanc. Oh, and um, ham. You put enough in to just cover it, not too much, because you need to keep it for all the other layers that you're doing. 
the reason that she put so many onions in and that she cuts them up earlier is that they, they um, a lot of juice comes out of them. And it's that juice and the lemon that is going to cook and tenderize the beef or bull. So now we put on a little bit of pepper and salt. Another layer of lemon, thyme, bay leaves and anchovies make this a fragrant and tasty dish. And then a final layer of the onion mix to finish it off. And this is how it looks. This is what happens when you macerate. See how it's all just completely, it's almost like pulled pork. It's all just completely um, melted into all the other ingredients. And it smells, the juice that you get from this is absolutely fabulous. Back in New Zealand, my culinary students are rolling up their sleeves for a morning lesson. The reward will be lunch in the garden at Mas de Zul. We're starting with a real southern French classic, pizza la dière, a kind of Provençal pizza but without the tomatoes. Thick with sweet sautéed onions and the pungent splendor of anchovies and black olives. With onions, there are many arguments about what a real pizza la dière is. And, uh, some people put tomatoes on it, but uh, the Niçois say you never ever put tomatoes on a pizza la dière. It's best to prepare the onions before the pastry dough, as they need to cook long and slow. They're sautéed in olive oil with garlic and thyme, caramelized almost to the point of being a puree, and they smell like heaven. My the dough mix contains a teaspoon of sugar or honey to feed the yeast. And then you just put your fingers. I've made what's called a pisala by grinding a few anchovies and olives to a paste with some olive oil. A teaspoonful mixes in with the dough. And you put the rest of the pisala in the onion. So you have to get it into the oven because you don't want a fat. Our unctuous onions are then smoothed onto the base and we commence the laying on of the anchovies, filling the spaces with the olives. It looks like a game of edible checkers. She figured it wasn't going to be enough, yeah. Well, I don't normally put that many anchovies on. And then um, sprinkle some thyme over the top. Now, starting to water, our pizza la dia goes in the oven at 200 degrees Celsius for about 25 minutes. Here's your pizza la dia. Oops, I'm burning myself. And with a gentle summer breeze blowing, it's lunch in the garden with the rosé flowing. The pizza la dière is served warm with a salad and courgette flowers stuffed with fish mousse and a gentle sprinkling of parmesan cheese and olive oil. Southern French cuisine uses a lot of olive oil. My students have spent the week fair soaking in it. So of course I want to know more about it. Especially when one of the best olive oils in France is produced just a few kilometers from Isère. Jules Granier is the man behind the oil I have fallen in love with. Domaine de Pierdon. And this is a very well established olive grove. These are my old babies. You can see different varieties. First, the, the picholine here. I, uh, when you say old, how old is this tree? Probably th three, uh, 300 years 300 old. 300 years okay, old. Okay, and so you the, see yeah. the frost killed the trees 50 years ago. My grandfather cut the trees. It was a life-saving operation. The roots of the severely frost-damaged trees were still alive, and the trees were in effect reborn. Olive trees are well known for their resilience and also their ability to store water. It's like the hump of the camel. Exactly. This is where they conserve the water and when it's... Because olive trees 
Hey. No, people like to say that olive trees like to suffer, like vines like to suffer. Yes. But it's not so much that they like to suffer, it's that they're used to yeah, they're used very to. Yeah. dry conditions. Gilles Picholine, Aglondou and Boutillon olive trees have had a very good year, with lots of moisture over winter and then a hot, dry summer. He's looking forward to an excellent harvest. Gilles has a degree in pharmacy and chemistry, which he's put to excellent use, researching the health-giving qualities of olive oil and producing his own. If you want to make a good olive oil for your health, it will be the best olive oil taste by tasting. Oh, that's interesting. So, uh, yes, and it's a good way to... Uh, it's a very to good way to it, make a decision. Yes, to, to make a decision. This is a lesson from the horse's mouth, so to speak. Gilles is a judge at France's leading olive oil awards. And moi? An extra virgin at this game. The best I make is the picholine. It smells like tomato plants. Very strong. So you swallow it? No, 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 no. Oh, you keep it you keep in, your, in mouth. your mouth and you breathe it. For 15 seconds. The ritual fashion gives you all the flavor. You have mm. to let you add down. It's lovely. It's like tasting chocolate slowly. Because you're always in such a hurry to eat chocolate. But if you actually put a bit of chocolate in your mouth and just let it sit there and melt, yes. it tastes so amazing. But you never give yourself the time to do that. It's bitter everywhere in, mm. in, in, in the mouth. It's a sign of very old trees, a lot of empty oak. Piadon mm. has been judged France's best olive oil three times. This is the pichol. Okay. And from now on, this is how I will eat cheese. Slathered in best olive oil with pepper on top. What is the chicory? Oh, oh, yeah. That's really. Mm. It's my last evening in the Camargue, and it couldn't be more perfect. A golden twilight journey down the canal running by the town of Egamoth with sweeping marshland views, pink flamingos, and the region's trademark white horses. My destination is Le Mas de la Comtesse Manard, the occasion an evening of bull farm theatrics, music, dancing, and feasting with a crowd of party-loving locals. And it all begins with a gorgeous traditional welcome. This is so fantastic. The beautiful way these beautiful women are dressed is called uh, Alizienne. And it's traditional, it takes them an hour to get the dress done, an hour to get the hat done, and then an hour to do all the finishing touches. And the quality of the fabric is absolutely beautiful, traditional, hand-blocked. And, um, and there's all sorts of, excuse me. <laughs> different, look, she's got all different layers, and it all has to be done properly. And then, could you turn around, we can see the hat, yeah? But look. And they're very typical southern French-looking women. They're very beautiful and dark with almond-shaped eyes. The people of the Camargue never seem to tire of these manly displays of horsemanship and bull roundup. Even though this is a performance for the visitors, this is the Camargue way of life, and they revel in it. I love discovering people so proud of keeping their heritage alive. And they need very little excuse for getting out these great big brazing pans for what's known as Le Grande Bruscade, traditionally done with Mediterranean mussels. Ah, um, it's, it's uh, sautéed vegetables with couscous and it's got cumin in it. And what are these um, animals on the spit? 
C'est quoi les animaux C'est des tons, c'est celui que vous avez vu. C'est vrai, c'est des tons, mais j'adore ça. They're bones. Fine, I'm getting to eat some bull meat that isn't a stew. Accompanied by lashings of sangria, the party ramps up with the antics of the local boys, honing their bull dodging skills for future glory in the local arena. <laughs> The guys that we see, the raseteurs in the Corsica Magues, this is where they start, doing things like this on their friends' farms or doing a bit of performance for people who want to know how it works. And, I mean, some of these, these boys are really young. This part of southern France is also Gypsy King territory, the sound of Spain and all its ribald foot-stomping glory. It's a cultural melting pot that stirs the soul and gets a party really happening. Barcelona, Barcelona. Barcelona, yo me... And this is a fabulous example of what I essentially love about the south of France, and in particular the Languedoc Roussillon region. The people here grasp life by the shoulders, shake it, hug it tight, and live it with an innate sense for balancing work, play, daily sustenance, and respect for age-old, life-affirming traditions. These totally modern people have a joie de vivre that's unabashedly joyful and healthy, and they make me feel right at home. And there's a party on the horizon at Martezul. It's our last evening together, and we are celebrating with a huge feast. For this one last cooking lesson, though, I'm taking a back seat to the ebullient, clever, and unpredictable chef de cuisine, Jean-Claude Altmaier. Like me, he's adept at putting everyone to work, starting with Santas or guinea And under the pretense of removing giblets, chef sets the pan for the evening's lesson. Monkfish typically arrive in a fishmonger with their heads already chopped off. Let me assure you they have rather gruesome mugs which you'd rather not see. But their firm white flesh is delicious roasted. It's got uh, piment de spilet, which is uh, chili from Espelet, very famous French chili. And uh, salt and pepper and olive oil and lemon. Such a fabulous feast. Jean-Claude is working backwards, preparing the evening's four courses. These North African tiger prawns are our starter. You um, cut them down the back. <laughs> the accompaniments to the seafood and guinea hen are an explosion of southern French late summer goodness. Simply prepared, and as far as these figs go, not sparing on the alcohol or the sugar. These will caramelize to perfection in the oven. Tomatoes are baked, fennel is braised, sets are peeled, and great big spring onions popped. This final session is a wonderful opportunity for my students to reflect on all they've taken on board during the week. Quite literally, too. They won't need to eat again for a month, at least. Chef never use these. They're looking beautiful. It's been a whirlwind of a week. We've wined and oh, how we've dined. I dearly hope my gastronomers have been inspired by the food of the Languedoc Roussillon. It's such a sumptuous and sunny cuisine, and it's eminently transferable to home kitchens the world over. So thanks for joining me, and au revoir until my next culinary adventure. Thank <laughs> you.